welcome back to my inner sanctum. I am your hostess, Countess Elizabeth, Mistress of the Macabre, and I would like to take a moment to welcome my new viewers to this channel and give thanks to another creature of the night, Creepy News, for giving me a shout out. Now, Memento Mori, or translated in Latin as, remember, you must die, are little reminders that the living make for themselves to highlight that they too will perish. One such token of memento mori that was popular in the 19th and 20th centuries were post-mortem photography. So let us turn the pages of that dusty family album you found in the attic as we explore our grotesque curiosity. Post-mortem photography was a popular practice in the 19th and early 20th century. This practice was commonplace and gratefully embraced as a form of both mourning and remembrance in both American and European cultures at the time. Now in modern times, we are left with these gems that are windows into the sensibilities of Victorians regarding death. People back then would invite a photographer over soon after the death, get the body in a serene pose known as the last sleep or the good death and would proudly display these photos in their homes for their family to see in remembrance. This is something that modern society would now deem as odd or in bad taste. But in the minds of people back then, this was generally something people would do out of love and respect for the dead. To remember their little brother Jimmy that died of diphtheria as a baby. In some cases, the only photo of a young child would be post-mortem. Remember, this was a time where death was everywhere, and photographs were not as common as today. The life of Victorians was grueling and filled with death. The advent of rapid urbanization and industrialization led to increased pollution in overcrowded cities. This combined with poor knowledge of hygiene and practices in a pre-germ theory society meant that disease was everywhere. Prior to 1860, the spread of diseases such as scarlet fever, typhoid, tuberculosis, or TB for short, diphtheria, and cholera were rampant and usually a death sentence. Infant and child mortality were extremely high, with 33% of children in London not reaching the age of five. For adults, the outlook wasn't much better. If someone were to make it into adulthood, the Victorian adult average life expectancy was also very low. In 1860, the average age of death for a man was 40, and 42 for a woman. While it was a possibility that some people would live into old age, it wasn't common for average people. I mean, in the modern day, it isn't as common to know someone who has died of tuberculosis or yellow fever. But back then, most people knew someone who died of TB, and it was a real problem, to the point where they had sanitariums for these people to remove them from society altogether. In this time, where death was everywhere, the advent of photography soon came into being with the daguerreotype. This led to a much cheaper form of preserving memories. Before the daguerreotype was invented, people had to hire an actual portrait painter. With the birth of the daguerreotype, this led to the art of post-mortem photography, where Victorians wanted to remember their dear child or relative. However, there are also a lot of misconceptions about Victorian post-mortem photos. There is a modern misconception that Victorians would haul out their dead, prop them on stands, and take a picture worth a thousand words. However, the myth of the standing Victorian post-mortem photo is false. There are a lot of fake Victorian post-mortem photos, or what are only thought to be dead people standing eerily and unnaturally. While it is true that there are genuine photos of the dead being propped up with the living, such as this one here, the idea that Victorians use stands to prop up their dead is false. As mentioned earlier, the first type of photos created were the daguerreotype. Daguerreotypes had what people would consider a long exposure time, which at the longest was a minute and a half actually. This does not seem like a long time to wait for your photo to be taken, but because photography was in its infancy, even one second of movement was enough for the subject to become blurry. But wait, what about the popular myth that the dead were propped up with these stands in such strange positions? Historically, it is not accurate to say that these stands were used for dead people. According to an expert in the field, Mike Zone, 
posing stands are similar to microphone and guitar stands now, though they are made of cast iron. They are not particularly sturdy or heavy, weighing perhaps 20 or 25 pounds. More damningly, they're not counterbalanced. They weren't made for or sturdy enough to actually hold up the weight of a dead body, Zone claims. If you set a corpse, rigor mortis would have needed to just set in the right way. On a posing stand, it would certainly topple over because it could not hold the weight. These stands were actually made to reduce the blur from a living person. Victorians had no use for these stands for the dead because the dead don't move to make blurry photographs. Dead people were usually lying down in a position representing the last sleep or propped up by relatives, which is actually more disturbing if you think about it. If the relative is propping up the body for a minute and a half, can you imagine the smell? There are a lot of explanations for those pictures we find that are post-mortem looking. And that is not to say that post-mortem photography wasn't a real thing, but most of the photos that involve people standing in strange positions were not actually dead. They had to stand in that way because the stands that held them in place, sometimes in an unnatural way. The blurring effect from the movement may also be the reason why people during this time period did not smile in photos as well. That smiling for a whole minute and a half was too painful and would result in an eerie blur. However, I can't say for sure that some bodies that look more propped up may not be dead, but the ones that show a person standing by themselves or with others like this one here does not show a dead body. The strange look on the child's face could be that the child blinked when the photo was taken. Another thing we must remember during this time is that flash was actually very new for these people as well. Anyone who's taken a photo and not realize the flash was on, might also make a strange face. Most of the genuine photos of dead people in this time period were children. But most of those children were usually laying down and not propped up, as seen here. That does not mean that there aren't examples where you can tell that the parent is propping the child up. But the majority of legitimate postmortem photos are those of people laying down, looking serene, the good death. Here you can even see a whole family posing next to a dead child. Even the cat is in attendance. So next time you see a Victorian photo of a standing dead person, just remember that they most likely weren't dead. Photography just wasn't as advanced. And having any kind of movement would have resulted in an eerie, blurry image. But if they were sleeping, well... And that's a different story. That was truly grotesque. All of those people, long gone to time. The only way that their families could remember them is with a little photograph of them sleeping serenely. However strange it may seem today, it was once something that was very common back then. And maybe next time you stumble upon an old family photo album in your attic, or in an abandoned house from the time period, and flip through it, you might stumble upon one of these photos showing the eerie semblance of a child in eternal sleep. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe, like, and share if you would also like to keep exploring our grotesque curiosity. We will meet again in the darkness of the night.